Yes, okay. Welcome everybody to Being a God is Hard. Uh, this panel is going to be about uh, making the transition from being a player of a DTRPG to being to running a DTRPG and uh, how that can be sometimes rocky and what we can do to make it go more smoothly. Um, I'm the moderator, my name is Nat, pronouns are they them. I've been playing various TTRPGs for Jesus, 15 years now, running them on and off for about 10. Um, mostly various editions of Dungeons and Dragons, but also Legend of the Five Rings and a couple other one-offs here and there. Um, and then we'll start on my right and go on down the table. Oh, name, pronouns, and what your gaming experience is. Uh, I'm Eric Zawadzki. I've been cool playing since for about 36 years. Um, I started in Redbox D&D, for those who don't know what that is anymore. Um, I uh, finished a running and playing games my whole life, essentially. Um, I also uh, write uh, for Onyx Paths, Arms of Darkness uh, books. I've done a lot of uh, Mage, the Awakening, Demon. I'm the uh, developer of the uh, Deviant the Renegades uh, line, which is the newest of the Chronicles of Darkness games. Um, so I, I do a lot. I, it is a big piece of my life. I'm Kevin Spignano. I've been, I'm Puerto Rican, which is, it colors the way that I DM. Um, I'm 53 years old. I've been at this for over four years. Nice. Um, have played in almost every gaming system out there. Um, my favorites are D&D because that's the first rule set that I learned and broke. <laughs> um, and now my own homegrown <laughs> gaming system called Simplicity. Woo. I'm Steve Semler, um, he, him pronouns, and um, I've been playing, running, uh, playing games since 1980. Um, so, yeah. You guys are making me feel young. This is great. <laughs> Oh my God. I get all these right here. So I've twice now. <laughs> a table of four. Yeah, I've kind of run, you know, kind of, you know, done, a, done a couple of home, homebrew game systems. I love the XD20, you know, the Extreme D20 system. But I'm back on D&D 5th edition for, for a while. I like the, the particular blend of just enough complexity, um, just, a, just, you know, but not too much. So that, that really kind of fits, fits nicely. And I've got a campaign, a salt wave campaign that I started in 1990 at Fort Richardson, Alaska, that is still working. Cool. Uh, so I use that with the, uh, the local Games by James <laughs> campaign I run. Cool. All right. So, uh, one thing, so I, we had a little bit of a document that we were throwing ideas in before we started. And I really appreciated that because there's one thing, I came into this thinking, oh, well, we're assuming that anyone who's looking to DM for the first time already has a group, because that was, that's been my experience. But someone, I can't remember who, thank you for pointing out that it's not necessarily the case. So I kind of wanted to ask a first little bit, assuming that, they, that a DM does not already have a group, do you have any uh, tips for how to find people who want to play? I'll start on my left and then we can go that way. Absolutely. Uh, local gaming shop, gaming store. Um, coffee shop that, that hosts uh, Magic the Gathering or, or tabletop role-playing games. They're often looking for uh, GM storytellers, so that's a good place to go and try it out and let people know. Hey, I'm going to try. I'm going to try out you know, the GM DM storytelling. And I was like, sure, we will we'll, we'll hook you up with people. Um, I would say if. You're still in high school or it's still at the college level. There should be an on-campus outlet. Um, or bully your friends. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, bully your friends and start. Um, it's really it's a good place to start making friends. It's a good place to figure out what you want to do. Um, if you're a bit older and beyond that, that's good. The source. Local here in the Twin Cities, it is the Mecca. Um, go there. I mean, Roseville has two really good shops, yes. it, you know, locally, and they both have areas where you can, you know, claim a table and start gaming. Um, a lot of times, all you need to do is just sit there with your your own bulk, and people will 
sit down and go, what are you doing? Yeah, that brings me to geek advertising. My, my tax hack when I was in college was I just started wearing around shirts that were very nerdy. Like, and looking for other people who were wearing stuff that was geek advertising. Dragon pendants, dragon shirts, cloaks. Hey, you interested in a role playing game? The good news <laughs> is that when you're running, when you try to run a game, um, it's easier in some ways to find a group than when you're just trying to play because nobody wants that everything. Nobody wants a gym, but it's a lot of people. people just, they're, they're here. Yeah, they're here. Yeah. But like, it's a lot more work, and you have a lot more control over the over the situation when you are the GM and you can get a group together. Um, online, uh, going on the forums that are or discords that are focused on the game that you want to run. Um, it may be, online play is a thing. It can be very successful. It can be very fun. Um, I have friends who like run like this overlap world and have like literally 20 different groups within one shared world that they run. Um, I know people that have met, hey, I, 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 you happen to be in the same city that I live in. Um, we should meet up, we should start a group. Um, so a lot of just networking, just keeping your eyes open for, um, for opportunities. Um, just like when you're running around con and you, you see someone who's wearing something that you recognize that is really obscure, and you're just like, oh my gosh, you can start a conversation about something that uh, you're maybe not so easy to find outside of outside of convention. Yeah, roll twenty. Um, oh yeah. Roll twenty. Yeah. Um, is that is that an org or anything? Uh, dot net. Roll twenty dot net. Yeah. Yes, that, it's a digital tabletop thing. You can roll dice. You can. Excuse me. Game Master. This game Master. Yeah, so yeah. It's a sort of generic term for anyone who is running a role-playing game. Um, it has all sorts of names in different settings. Storytellers in World of Darkness, Chronicles of Darkness. Um, uh, DM Dungeon Master is Dungeons and Dragons uh, specific. Um, but uh, you get some silly ones depending on what game system you, you get. And, and it's kind of based upon the mechanic that you're using to run a game. It's based on the mechanic that you're using to run the game. Um, storyteller games, normally whoever is the, the winner of the encounter takes the story. Um, in dungeon, dungeon Masters, there's a lot of dungeons. Yeah. A lot of dungeons. <laughs> um, in Game Masters, normally they're not in dungeons, but they're running a game, game kind of scenario. That before going in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's uh, say we've got either you've bullied your friends to try this new game or you've put up posters and you found people. Um, I find that when you want to, uh, or at least in my experience, when I'm trying to put together a campaign, um, there are usually some like big questions or that I need to answer to myself before I can move forward. Um, one that I use for myself is what is the theme? of the game that I want to run. That is the question I always ask myself. And I was wondering, what's, what are some questions that you as, you know, running game runners have to ask yourself? What is the first thing that you are always asking when you are setting out to actually sit down and write this dang thing? What game am I running? That's a good <laughs> one. Number one, what game am I running? Um, if, if I am playing with people I know, um, it's good to know their taste because then I can pitch something that I know that they'll all enjoy. Um, and they'll be able to riff off of easily. Because it's a, it, role playing is a collaborative storytelling activity. I mean, you are not just one person playing like a bunch of schlubs. Everyone is there to have fun, and everyone is there to participate, and everyone contributes. Um, and uh, I'll get into that more later. But that, that's thing one, is what game am I playing? And kind of what's the high concept? You know, uh, my, my wife does great high concept games. Um, she was like, okay, we're gonna do Order 66, you were all at the Jedi Temple at when Order 66 went off. And that's how we're gonna start. You might have been a droid, just someone who was in the right, wrong place at the wrong time, you could have been a Padawan, you could have been a prisoner of the Jedi, you know, all sorts of, and whatever you want to do, but that's the premise, you have to be on, on here in the, in the temple when, when things go down. Um, we one time, we did a, uh, a fifth, fifth year high school reunion as the kickoff for a Buffy the Vampire Slayer game. Um, so that was, that was fantastic. Um, we, she did one where we were all on a plane, um, and uh, a vampire attacked, like went nuts because it was going to be gone because there was a delayed. That was a hundredth vigil game. 
Um, so we had to deal with a vampire who was not in the best situation, um, and then go, okay, the supernatural is real, now what? And we met each other by this situation. So what's the high concept? Where are we starting? Um, and, uh, and, you know, what we want to plan. In, in that sense, have your party together first. Get your people together. Um, it works best, I find, if I'm working to develop the story, the high concept, with all of them there. That way, they have buy-in, and there's no headbutting from the very beginning. Oh, I don't want to go with the group. Everybody's going to want to come in, come in and go with the story because they know the concept. So that actually dovetails into something else I wanted to ask a little bit later, which is how involved do you want the players to be in the groundwork, the world building, that kind of thing? It sounds like, Kenneth, for you, it's very much so. Is that kind of what you say? <laughs> it, it kind of depends. So if I'm, if I'm running a, a D and D five game for a game, a local game store, I have eight seats available for players. Six of them are going to be campaign reserve seats. Those are going to be folks that are committed to be there for week after week. We're running a campaign. Then two, the other two seats are drop-ins. And I've got pre-generated characters that go with what we're going to do for people to just drop in and play for us. Um, the first time I ran this, it was me. You know, I had no idea who the group was. Absolutely. This this next time after COVID, post COVID, starting it up again. It's I know who my players are going to be for four or five of those those seats. Hey, it's going to be D D five. Here's some options. Do you want to play this or this or this? What do you want to do? And then I use the session zero concept to to get people involved. And say, hey, what kinds of things should we be doing? What do we want? To, what do we want to develop? What do we want to play? And then you know I'm as the Dungeon Master taking that forward, making sure that we're meeting rule number one. Rule number one being, it should be fun. Have fun. Have fun. And the corollary is not at others' expense. So let's do another definition time. <laughs> session zero. Session zero is the session you have before your first session. Um, generally, it is something that is done to for example, in uh, my group session zeros, we tell each other, oh, I'm going to play this kind of character with this kind of background, and we can like make sure that we have a well-balanced party if that's something we're interested in doing. If we're like, oh, it'd be really cool if our, my character and your character you know, knew each other and we've done this before, and so we get a bit of that going. And also, it's a time to, for example, talk about, hey, you know, I, I'm a new father. I don't want to have any sort of like child endangerment, like kids in peril type themes or any sort of like triggers if someone has a history of trauma that they want to avoid. That's also what a session zero is for. Um, so moving on to like session zeros, are there, what other um, topics do you guys usually discuss in session zeros? Because I do think that they are critically important to the game. Um, one thing that you want to talk about in your session zeros are endings. What makes that character fulfilled? Um, another thing that you want to talk about is traumas. Because as a GM, as a, as a storyteller, you can use what the character's trauma. Okay, I want to clear yeah. what we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Character yeah. trauma or player trauma? No, those... <laughs> if you want to understand something, you really need to get your players to understand there's a difference between their character and them. What is happening to their character is not literally happening to them. So, if you run into someone who can't distinguish that, my advice is run really, really quickly the opposite way. Because that kind of a person is going to make your gameplay extremely difficult. Um, I was going to say logistics. When do we meet? Yes. How long do we meet? What's quorum? Quorum being, What's the bare number of players we need to have in the room in order for us to con continue to play the game? And sometimes that varies. If it's going to be a climax and you know you want every single person in the room, you might have to wait, oh, I think we're at six weeks now. <laughs> we've, got, we've got a group of like eight adults with children, all of them, and families, and uh, so we've been having a little rough summer for that. But, um, you know, if you're, are you eating together? Um, 
And if so, who's, how are you dividing the cost of that, or are you dividing the cost? What happens when the kids come downstairs? Who's in charge of chasing them back upstairs or get whatever crisis happens to be rising at that moment? Uh, there's all of those little details of, uh, of how do we make sure that we are in the space together? Um, or if you're not in a physical space together, what digital tools will you use yeah. to be able to play the game? Yeah. Um, some are better than others. Um, I see you have a question. We're going to have the last 15 minutes be for questions, so hold on. <laughs> um, yes, and also just as a thing, we'd like to take turns providing dinner for everyone. It's like a potluck thing. It's nice. It's fun to do that. Um, so once you have the session zero, one of the things that I also, this kind of is both a pre-game prep thing and also once the game kicks off kind of thing, is kind of figuring out um, gosh, who was it? I think, Ken, it was you brought up the different types of, of, of storytellers that you can have. Like there's the, well, there's the storyteller, there's like one of that I thought it was like, the, or the chaos goblin, I think you called it. Or the chaos, the, uh, chaos dragon. Yes. Um, and so I kind of wanted you, I, I've heard, seen this, you know, kicked around in various TTRPG spaces that talk about the theory of, of running games of like different styles. And so I kind of wanted to think about, can we, I'd like to hear you elaborate on that a little bit. Okay, so the, the five that I put down for um, this particular example, there's hunters. Um, the, pers the person DM DMing that is in, he's hunting the player characters. The kind of, the kind of DM that <laughs> takes it as his personal mission to kill people off. An adversarial DM. Yeah, yeah there it is. <laughs> Um, the rule fundamentalist, the person that believes that the rules of the game are paramount to anything. So if you roll badly, he, you, you die, but it's, you die because of the rules, not because of him. There is the enabler, the person that's willing to give everything and anything to, to the players just to keep them happy, Monty Hall type of thing. Um, there's the storyteller, the person that believes that the story is the most important thing. So he will bend reality just for a good scene. And then there's the chaos dragon. <laughs> the person that DMs by the seats of their pants. Um, who never seems to have an idea or a structure to the story, and they never plan anything out beyond the party's need, needs to go here or there. And I think it's also there's a lot of a lot more to it than just that because some of those are bad habits like adversarial yes. games. Like okay, let's I will take one weird example. <clears throat> Paranoia. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a humor game. And in this in this world, it's a dystopian world where everyone has six clones and they have a tendency to drop like flies. It's great in one shots in short run games, um, but the GM is encouraged to. I mean, the mantra is entertain or die. Yes. Um, if you are fun. The GM is encouraged to just let let it let it slide. At least let you have your have your fun. If you're boring, <laughs> off you go. The DM um, which is you know, that, like I said, that's a comedy game. It's a little different from if you do that in a in a, a very serious uh, story driven game, it's gonna it's gonna feel wrong if you're gonna get hurt. Is no, that like, the one that had the Jenga mechanic? No, that's 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 dread. Yes. I haven't played Dread, but I've, I've heard that the, when that Jenga thing is about to go down, you, every time you take a risk, you take a piece out of the Jenga. And if the, if the, to, if the tower topples, your character dies. <laughs> but, 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 but part of the mechanic is you, cannot, you can topple the tower over and you give your character a cinematographic death. Meaning, you know, he splendidly um, commits his, you know, commits to his own death to save the party from doing something. And to be clear, like, these different, and I, I hear what you're saying about some of these are bad habits, but I, I want to push back on that a little bit because I think that none of them are inherently bad. Because I think even a good GM needs to be a little bit adversarial sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, because they need to actually... You present a challenge. You exactly, yeah. present a challenge. Um, so, and I also point out that none of these are um, no one's just one or the other. Everyone's a mix of everything. It might change depending on the, the situation. The situation, exactly. And is there anything you wanted to add to this, like kind of idea of GM concepts? Um, 
I'll, I'll go back to I'll go back to kind of that thing I was saying before about rule number one. If since you're playing together, everybody should be having fun and not at the expense of other of, of others. Uh, the GM needs to help that happen, facilitate that, um, while creating some sort of challenge. I mean, a game is, is a series of, of, of meaningful choices. Would you consider there to be a different, meaningful difference between facilitating and enabling, as previously mentioned? Um, yes, yeah, enabling, the way, kind of from that, the classic definition is, um, we are going to give everything. We're going to be easy. I will say, though, that if you um, reward like, having, let it, if they play along, if they play along and bad stuff happens to them because they're playing along with their with the genre conventions and you reward them, they're going to do more of that. And yeah. This is just like classic, past classical conditioning. If you do something nice to someone after they do something, they're going to do more of that. If you do something bad to someone after they do something, they're going to usually do less of that. And so you have to think really hard about what behavior am I rewarding and what behavior am I punishing? Because if they're being creative and clever and smart and they're coming up with a really good idea and you're smacking it down, they're going to stop doing that and that's not very much fun to me. Um, and the opposite is also true. If they're, um, if they're being boring and you're letting them just sort of slide on it, it's, they're just going to do that. Yeah. That actually um, dovetails into something else I wanted to ask that can come up during, once the campaign is underway, which is how do you deal with conflict at the table? And I'm not talking about like, oh, we need to fight this enemy army. I mean like conflicts either about what a rule is supposed to mean, like I think it means that I do this amount of damage. No, you should have only done this amount of damage. And also like conflict between players, like one thinks the other one's being unnecessarily mean to their character or something. That ha how can, has that come up for you in game? I'm sure it has. Have you dealt with it? I set that up in session zero mm -hmm. uh, with basically a list of, of group norms. Because <laughs> um, psychology sort of stuff. But, um, you know, here's, you know, so, so those through, you know, the DM is going to listen to everybody, but be, but be the final arbiter of the rules piece. And you're going to handle conflicts by um, first trying to get character, and then the DM's going to the player of the rules that they agreed to on how to get, get along with each other. For example, if Grasque, the, the barbarian chieftain, insists on calling every spellcaster a warlock, including those in his own party, how are the people, how are the players and you know, how are the characters reacting based upon their players? And as DM, do I need to, where do I need to step in and help facilitate? Cross case player from keeping that so it's fun for everybody and not hitting them. Um, as a DM, your job is at, at game zero set the boundaries. And for one of my boundaries is I have the last say. The, the, the storyteller, the person that's running the game, the person who has the story is the one who gets to dictate how it goes. Now, please believe in me that I'm not going to kill your character off if you don't, if you're not actively working to do that yourself. So, if your character dies, it's not me, it's you doing that. People who've played with me before understand that kind of terminology, and they'll be like, no, let him go, let, let him do his thing. <laughs> Those who, and I ran this in at, at Convergence for the last like 15 years now. Um, when I run my game Simplicity, um, I, it, it, it is a yes and system. So you win, you win the, the competition, you get to say, this is what happened, and and as the DM, I then have to react to that and move the story forward from there. Um, it, it's one of those things that it's, that kind of story, that kind of playing needs to be developed. So not everybody is ready for that kind of game. Um, and it, it's one of those things that it's like, my game system has a bit of right dice rolling, but it also has a lot of storytelling. So that's, that's the one that I like to play with, and that's, 
when people sit at my table, that's why I need to sit down and tell them these are the rules. This is how I'm going to be like a DM. And if you have issues, we will stop, we will talk about it, and then we will move forward. I'd say that the uh, uh, player conflict versus rules conflict are, are two really different things. I mean, there's some similar, like there's some overlap, but I would say, generally speaking, when you're, especially when you're a new GM, or if you're new, in a new system, there's going to be times where, if in order for you to get to the rule that you're looking for, it could take a while, and it's going to bog down plenty. And so sometimes the thing to do is just do a table ruling now. Just get to the play moving, and then we can talk about it when we get to the end, or someone can look it up while they're off scene, um, and we can figure out what that what we're, what we're supposed to do in that situation. Um, and that's totally normal. There's nothing that, if you normalize that sort of thing, play continues. Um, player conflict is, is its own complicated thing. Um, session zero is a, a big deal. Um, and, and like logistics are part of it, but part of it is what they call social contract. What is, that, what is allowable? What, what, what are the lines that I, you can't cross as a GM and, as, and the other players should avoid? Um, if there's an issue during play, and maybe they don't feel it right away, but at the end they're like, oh, that really bothered me. You need to talk it out. I mean, you have to be grown-ups about this. Um, I, uh, I work in client services in my, in my day job, and they always talk about sales is hard, which is why retention is so important. Getting a group together is hard, which is why setting yourself up for success so that game group can, can live together and, and be and work together and have fun together for years to come is it's just gold. But you ha you have to be adults about it. Um, you know you can't like you know <laughs> you, you can't just ignore all of those possible problems and conflicts and uh, and just hope that, 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 that no no one no one is ever upset or offended. And yeah, see the see the plain evil clear characters panel tomorrow. I'll be in yeah. that one too. <laughs> and, and another piece of that is like you got to make sure that like if there's someone who's toxic in your group, you need to get rid of them. Yes. Uh, that's I mean I, I hate to, I hate to be a mean guy, but yeah, you have to get rid of toxic. It, it goes against the, the geek social fallacy that yeah. because geeks have been historically you know marginalized. marginalized in social groups, we cannot socially marginalize anyone. Yeah, we can, and sometimes we should. If they are genuinely harmful, like terrible people, they deserve to be kicked out. Yep, it's our gaming table. It's a GM, it's your gaming table. Just like you're asking them to join your table, you can ask them to leave. No, actually, you can tell them to leave. It, it sucks. It, it sucks, sucks to do. It sucks. You are fired. Get out of here. Um, I think, moving on from that, I, there is, I think, probably the biggest and most talked about new GM quandary or thing that they try to figure out, and it's something that I also struggle with to this day, which is how much do we write ahead of time and how much do we just make up as we go along? Um, I'm that chaos game. Yeah. <laughs> that solves that problem. I love sandbox games, so I spend like countless hours preparing the world and the, all the NPCs and all the moving parts and factions, and then I just let the players loose in it. And I have some structure, but basically whenever the play slows down, I like to throw another plot hook in. And then my games get a little unwieldy and I have to like figure out a way of tying them all in. Um, to that end, I, I will build certain aspects to my game that get used over and over and over again. Um, my guilds are in, across all my worlds and all my universes, there are these guilds. And there are specific widows, you know, mafia characters that run the underbelly of the city. Um, if you say, you know, if your character is playing in one of my games and he's like, I'm going to talk to Uncle Guido Tom. Okay, there's an Uncle Tom Guido. Um, try to get, you know, what I need from him. Okay, there's a chance, there's an opportunity there. You don't have to go through the whole process of explaining how you know him, how he's, the, you know, he's linked to you or whatever. It's just there. This is an example of that yes and yep. you know, method that you were discussing earlier. I think also going with a yes and is also the no but. Like, <laughs> I'm not going to give you what you want, but I'll give you this other thing that will get you along. Or yes, but, where I'm going to give you exactly what you want, but there's a catch. Um, which is also <laughs> that's, it's fun. that's what yeah. One of the things I have found as a GM over the years is that every person who runs games is different, and if, once you 
I know we're talking about new GMs, but when you have a sense of knowing yourself, you get so much easier to run games. I know that I have the most energy at the beginning of the game. That's why I put in so much legwork at the beginning, because after about a year and a half, I'm kind of just wanting to have a book that I can flip open and find a thing that I can work with. Um, but I have to write that book. Um, and it's a lot easier for me to do that before the game even starts than when I'm exhausted. Um, my wife runs these really tightly run games and like plans them to death and is just so amazing at them, but she, she's a very different GM than I am in that respect. Steve, how much pre-writing do you do for your campaigns? Um, I, I, I am always starting with a what if. What if there were these uh, newbies in water deep? Uh, in the Forgotten Realm setting uh, that we all have access to already and people have read books about that. You know, that's, that's an easy one. But what the, the bigger one for my, for my own campaign was what if we combined, okay, now this is going back to 1990, what if we combined Shadowrun and Dungeons and Dragons and the Murray Niven uh, Manx and Wars? <laughs> that's and, and, and humanity and Kazunkai were uh, the large Tigri, three foot tall felines, uh, were colonists to this world that the dragons actually had first. And so everything started from that point, and I developed, you know, I developed the what are the nations, what are the, what's the big situation? Give me just enough detail to let me kind of start playing with the what ifs. But I knew that for the player characters, it was going to be, I'm going to start the village, and there's going to be an adventuring party, and I'm going to try not to have them meet at the tavern. Because <laughs> um, I knew that it was, that it was already appreciated that all the players had done the Let me find something other than that cliche to get the party members together. So, I, I don't even remember what it was. It was probably an organization. Um, yeah, so like the, the Guido Tom sort of thing. And there was an organization that people already had to connect, the player, the characters, so, but already had a connection to. And Guido Tom would have uh, a mission for them that made sense for that organization in that particular place in the time. And yeah, as the GM, I knew here's this big world story that the characters and players didn't even figure out for like two or three years. I like that we have a kind of a, the whole range of extremes from almost all improv to excessive, no offense, <laughs> like extreme, I should say extreme amounts of uh, pre-planning. And I was kind of thinking about it, and as I was listening to I realized that they both have their benefits and their drawbacks. So, here's, I'm going to lay a question towards each type of GM here. Um, for the improv heavy GM, DM, how do you keep all these improvised details straight for future sessions you can drop on in the future and then for the pre-planners how do you deal with as soon as the players touch something they're going to go woo off in that direction without railroading them which i know is something that a lot of teams are very afraid of doing as uh, the fly by the seat of my pants i take notes <laughs> <laughs> that's that's copious notes and then there's also something that i've built into all my games even in dnd rapid um, are all the DM points, are all the points that you get from the, from the DM, storyteller, GM, all the points you can get, boys and girls? No! You can get points from the other players. What did they do that was fabulous that you want to give them a point for? You know, and that actually makes for really good rap life because you will sit at the table for another half hour just cracking up over the the scenes that were created throughout the game. You know, with sandboxing, um, it's I expect them to go off and do their own thing. I, I, I mean, I, I put those characters there, those organizations there to get kicked. The sandbox, people are walking in it and they're kicking the sand and castles over. And that's okay, that's what I expect. Um, and so I just roll with it. Um, my wife's favorite, she's a, she's a much more of a planner than I am, like I said. Um, her favorite saying is, people don't mind being railroaded as long as the train is going somewhere they want to go. <laughs> <laughs> That's damn good advice. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I was like, yeah, you read right. this fantastic advice. Um, but yeah, if, if, again, knowing your players and knowing what their character goals are, if someone talked about what, what do you want your end point to be for your character, what would satisfy you, 
uh, as the end of the story. Um, and then like work toward that, figure out how to, how to make it so that the opportunity is in that general direction, and they'll go right for it. So it's, it's not so much a railroad as much as a very tasty carrot. Yes, yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, I, I, don't, I, I think it's, I think it's a, like, the Dungeon Master guy for 5th edition. It's probably somewhere else, but don't say no, determine difficulty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you'll hear, my, my spouse is back. Um, <laughs> you'll hear me say uh, to, hey, I want to jump on top of that ledge and then flip over and grab the grab the uh, the foe around the neck and then body slam and flipping him flipping him over so that I can grab the dagger out of his hand. You can okay. Try. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Roll and impress me. And sometimes they do. <laughs> One of the things I need to make the DC difficult uh, like. Will set difficulty is I always think of dice as a writing prompt. Yeah, yeah. Like I often don't know exactly what I, the goal is per se, but I would assume the dice say, and that will give me a little bit of a sense that okay, do I want it to be easy this time, or do I want it to be like? And if dice say that I should make it a little harder, I'll make it a little harder because it's, it makes it surprising to me as well. I I developed this back when there were like tables for D&D &D, that a DM could just roll a, you know, 2D10 and D100 and there was like percentages for everything. Um, you know, and you just, okay, I rolled a 53, 53 says you get attacked by TM. Okay, it doesn't matter that TM was in the room or not, you just got attacked by TM. Um, so it, it's one of those things, it's like, I'll, I always have two tens in my hand, and I roll. Is it high or is it low? If it's low, you can get away with it. If it's high, screw it. If it's really high, okay, this might turn into something fun. You know? So it, it, it's one of those things, it's like, you, again, you don't want to kill them. You want them to have fun. Death is released, not punished. I mean... Uh... <laughs> It's also good to know that you can always override the dice. If you roll and you go, oh, I think it's gonna, I think I'm gonna be giving these two things, and you're like, I'm disappointed with it. This roll. Okay, and so, it's okay. And set that in your session zero rules. So yeah. let them know the DM, uh, unless you're going to intentionally, everyone's agreeing to going exactly by the rules mm -hmm. you know, that style of referee. But let them know I am going to cheat on the dice sometimes, and I'm going to cheat for fun. <laughs> Do you, <laughs> do you let them know when you're doing that? No. no, no, no. <laughs> they, should, it, they should feel like they gotta give me something. Yeah. Yeah. I remember in Paranoia, the, uh, they had different, different styles of dice rolling, and one of them was Behold the GM Most Fair, which is when you roll the dice publicly because you, you want to make it clear to the players that you don't care whether they live or die. Yeah. <laughs> so, Look, what I run is we ran a fourth at D&D game, and we were doing very much a, a tactical board game out of it. And it was a lot of fun. We played it for like three years. But I would roll in public because, I mean, I set the encounters. I know what the difficulties are. If I'm ramping it up a little, the dark dice aren't going to help that much. Um, so. Well, in that, to that sense, make the difficulty something that they can handle. Yeah. Oh, you know, okay, they're being attacked by a purple worm. Well, this purple worm isn't a full mature purple worm, and they're actually able, you know, it's only got half the hit points. What about encounters that you want them to run away from? Is that something that you will ever do in your campaigns, where this is obviously they've outmatched and you want it to be a dramatic moment for them to flee? It's hard, um, <laughs> it is because from a computer gaming mode and probably where people, the players have been before, they're used to succeeding and beating. I get the, I defeat the monster, I get experience and treasure. I defeat the monster, I get experience and treasure. Therefore, everything should be winnable. Another piece of, of fantastic role-playing advice that's a little too pat is, the players are rabbit sharks. Any plot that assumes that there's something other than rabbit sharks is doomed to fail. It's a little bit of an overgeneralization, but people, the characters and players tend to latch onto things and they will not let them go. And yeah, you're right, it is hard to get them to, to, to 
retreat. Yep. We used to have what we called blind flash the obvious checks, which were the easy, we like super ridiculously easy perception check when the GM was like, no, this is stupid. You don't want to do that, I promise. Well, then, the way I normally handle those situations, you send something after them that is way beyond their level. And you don't hold back. They just got hit, you know, they've got 14 hit points, they just got hit with 12. They'll run it. Yeah, and, and even if you're pulling the punch a little bit, like you're just pulling it <laughs> just, enough, just enough to keep them from uh, yeah. dropping dead in one hit. But yeah, they, you're right. If, you think, if their big tanky fighter gets down to like two hit points on a first hit from one of the five of them that they're dealing with, they, they should probably figure it out, even if they're a little um, rather jerk. I, I tend to probably a reflection more on me, but I have, in, in that situation, I'll have one player get it immediately, three players get it after the tank gets that massive hit, and the tank probably is the one taking it. So, no, I can take it. <laughs> <laughs> which, then puts, which then puts me in the situation, okay, I'm trying to let the die roll. I just, there we go. Behold the GM most fair. <laughs> well, there you go. There's also one other trick, and that is always have one of your characters in their group. Mm. If you're going to take out the, the character to prove the point, mm. take out yours. You just, the, the super tank, the one that you hired to take you through, just got nailed. What does that tell you? It shows me how the monster works. <laughs> so you're, you're, you're bringing up a concept that's sometimes called the DMPC, yep. um, which for those unfamiliar, it's the, the Dungeon Master's player characters. Basically, it's an NPC, but it, they're fully statted like a regular player character, and they are part of the party sometimes for a significant period of time, sometimes for a whole day campaign. Um, I, it's interesting you bring that up because I feel like, it, from my reading, that DMPCs have fallen out of favor a little bit in terms of the culture. Um, and because it's seen as the DM kind of like interfering too much with the party, I'm kind of curious to see what you all think about that. Bentley, the uh, psionic rat swarm, the cranium rat swarm. So it's like illithid, mind flare created rats, psionic rats. Uh, it's a swarm of creatures, so it's not, you know, each rat has like one hit point or something. But it's, it's a character, it's a, as a character, it allowed me, the DM, to not be really intrusive because those powers aren't, aren't going to overwhelm the, the players individually or collectively, but it's something to throw a whole ton of fun into it and allow half of Bentley's rats to be wiped out immediately. <laughs> it, 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 you know. <laughs> I was going to say it helps if they give the players the ones that pick up. Um, like, for example, I was running an Exalted game, and one of the players had decided that he, she was uh, accompanied by her, like a, like a second or third cousin, um, who was yeah. ostensibly like her bodyguard, but also like her plan B in case other uh, arranged marriages didn't work out. Uh, she spent a lot of the game being called Plan B. Um, or her, or her husband, um, <laughs> uh, but you know that was like one that was in the back backstory, and he was like, he wasn't like he wasn't super powerful. He was he was a kind of a someone that they submitted to rescue. So he, he I get to use him as a damsel in distress sometimes. Um, he did participate in combat and sometimes like kind of like did ridiculously well better than he should have, which they loved when that happened. Um, they also adopted like. They were, they were in this sort of like athletics competition. Um, Exalted, I don't know if, you, if any of you are familiar with, Exalted are basically like demigods. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they're in this competition with a bunch of other demigods and some not demigods. And one of the not demigods that like did unbelievably well was like some like 14 year old girl. I um, mean, <laughs> they just sort of decided she's going to be in our party. I'm like, okay, that's kind of creepy, but like, okay, this is fun. Um, so, because he gets basically their daughter now. And uh, yeah, so uh, it's also a fantasy world, so you can get away with this for step one. But um, but like they picked that character to be someone that they that accompanied them, and as long as they don't outshine or overshadow or steal the niche of another player's character, they're fine. 
and they can, they can add comic relief. They can be um, a bit of a mentor figure, or at least have the skills that the players didn't bother to get because they had nothing they need. Um, especially in a small group, it's hard to get the, get all the skill sets that you need for for a successful play. Um, so yeah, pick, love that pick characters. The uh, the other thing is that as a DM, even though you play all the other characters, you might still want to have a character in there for you. Um, I mean, this game is supposed to be fun for you as well. So that whole aspect of it going out of favor, I'm sorry, you're just not playing the right game. <laughs> um, the, the aspect there also is your character, understand your character isn't the main focal point. As long as you do that, I'm sorry, we had one character that was in a campaign with us that was like that. We started calling him Pincushion. <laughs> because he basically, we thought he got cursed at some point. Every arrow fell into him. It just came to him. And it was, you know, the DM who was running the campaign was like, it wasn't the fact that he was rolling to cause this to him. It was the fact that just the dice were saying this. And it became an ongoing thing that became comic relief that we ended up starting to use him, you know, in certain situations, like setting him off traps. <laughs> <laughs> we actually had, we actually resurrected him like three times. <laughs> and then we had him blush. Just let me die. <laughs> let me stay dead. <laughs> Is that four questions or five? Was that four questions or <laughs> <laughs> um, that was well that was the time when I wanted to actually move on to any questions from the audience. So perfect. Um, yes, right in the front here. Okay, sure. I, um, would there be a, a good book or website that would explain the things you said? There are so many. <laughs> There's um, actually I will say that 5th uh, Ed D&D's DMG actually does a fantastic job. I mean, yeah. I, uh, Dungeons and Dragons 5th Ed, 5th Edition's Dungeon Master's Guide, actually I thought that it did a really good job covering a lot of these topics. And you can buy that as a physical book and it's, in a bookstore yeah, or online. And it's because it's all in one place, that's the trick. It's like, there's so much great advice that it's like scattered all over the internet or all over these different games. But I, I thought DMG did a really good job even as someone who's been running games for very long. Um, as a young DM, that? as a young DM, somebody who's never DM'd before, um, get the get the book that you want to run, read yeah. it. I mean, they spend you know what will spend a huge amount of time developing those games, and the stories in the books are funny as hell. So you know it's worth the read. Um, go ahead, spend the time then bring in people that you're willing to trust and move from there. So, I mean, honestly, in my, it, when I advise, when I mentor young people who want to be, you know, uh, DMs for the first time, we find a group of people they're willing to play with first. That's the first and foremost thing that you need to do. Then you find the game that you want to run, you do your research, you do your homework, and then you come together as a group and figure out how you can do it. Um, I'll echo the I'll echo the Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition Dungeon Master Guide as a great place. The, the the designers on that did comb the internet, and then that's where they put that's where they they put the suggestions. I'll put in a vote for that one too. It's quite good. There's a reason why I think that this particular edition of Dungeons & Dragons has reached the astronomical levels of popularity that it has. It's not just because of Critical Role or Stranger Things. Or Stranger Things. <laughs> like, it genuinely is very beginner-friendly in a way that uh, is third edition especially was not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, third edition was nice because it got rid of, it got, it was the first one to get rid of that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when, if you, you need a slide roll to figure that sucker out. Um, I believe you in the red shirt, uh, you had a question earlier. Do you still have that question or did we address it already? Um, 
I need to remember what it was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, the uh, Jedi in the back. Um, I started DMing over COVID, and I did one of the uh, official modules, the Lost Minds of Fendelver, and we finished that, and then I had like a second session zero with my players to see if they wanted to go on with the same characters or start a new adventure, and they gave me feedback that they wanted to continue, they wanted to do a uh, pirate campaign, so I've started like building it myself rather than having a model to rely on, and the other feedback they gave me was they they didn't really like the big bad of uh, that one, so they wanted one that was more involved with mm -hmm. them, uh, so they'd get more satisfaction when they finally faced it. And I'm really having trouble squaring that circle of like giving them a compelling villain when it's also like a sandbox and I'm making it up every week at a time. I'm giving them like three or four options and letting them choose which direction they'd like to go. And how do I square that circle? Who would like to start? Oh. Um, one option is depend, highly dependent upon your players and your own, own kind of comfort with it, but um, lieutenants of the main villain, uh, lieutenants and then captains, if it's a pirate campaign especially, um, one ship of, of, pot, of enemy, enemy pirates or whoever, whatever, um, allows you to under, allows them to understand who it is that they're fighting, what's the organization, and to learn who this rival pirate king actually is. And so they get to beat some. And then the next one, the, the, the villain, that, my, that supporting villain, gets away. And you get to engineer how that happens. How are you going to make the, the villain get away so it becomes the possibility of a recurring villain? Let your recurring villains die every now and again, but, they, but try and line up the progression through the campaign to that rival pirate king, for example. So that when you get to the rival pirate king, you've seen him, you've fought his lieutenants. It's a climactic story. If I can just piggyback off of it, have the bad guy win once in a while. Not necessarily like defeat your players in combat, but get the thing that they were trying to get first yes. or something like that. Because they will fucking hate him. Yes. <laughs> and they will be very involved with that bad guy ever since. Um, building strife, building um, anticipation, building tension. That's what will get them to buy into the bad guy. Um, uh, the aspect of in, 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 having an arch villain, having your you know nemesis, it comes from not getting what you expect. You know, and the villain doesn't have to be straight up. You can have a pirate, you know, pirate king Roberts, and have that pirate king Roberts be somebody different every time. It's the fact that you know they kept messing your plan up, or the ninja ninja Kenku clan. Yep. <laughs> yes. I'm going to do something that's going to turn things on heads. Okay. Um, so there's a mechanic in, in Deviant uh, where they call it. Gosh, what do we even call it? It's basically every at the end of every session, you play out a brief scene with players on the villain side, mm -hmm. and them talking. What are what are they up to? And so that you give them an opportunity to participate in the villainy of these these folks that they are opposed to. That's it. Um, so that that was something that uh, that I thought was really was really clever when the writer came up with that. Um, but uh, linking them up to things that they they don't like, like if something bad happened in a previous adventure, somehow it was their fault. Um, you know, or there's clues that maybe they're behind. You know, the, the outbreak of like Anthropy and this town. Um, how, how exactly? You figure it out, you can. But, uh, <laughs> but making it so that they're responsible. Uh, a little bit of calf guiding maybe, but um, very much make them the person behind the curtain. Rather than and just, if they weren't at first, you can make them that way. Like you, can, you can come up with something. One, one thing that I would say, in your session zero, figure out what the character flaws are for their character. That can play into giving you your bad guy. Yeah. Uh, with the green shirt. Yes, um, I remember my question. Um, so, also sort of addressing that, um, 
there's, there's a concept in video games uh, going back to the, what if you just want the characters to run away from a fight? It's, it's the concept of the hopeless boss fight, where it's like, this is a fight that you can't win. And then, so you, so you put everything into like getting away and surviving. And, uh, but then doing that with your big villain, and then later on, when you are at a higher level and you are stronger, then you can go back and fight the villain, and it's that much more uh, rewarding then, because now you can beat it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, just to give a brief example, I was in a game as a player where we encountered a Rakshasa, which, uh, for those who don't know, are these tiger-headed demons whose hands are backwards, and they are incredibly powerful magic users, and uh, spells below, I think, like, level, like, six or something ridiculous like that just won't work, will not work out. Um, and we knew we were, like, because we were doing a bit of metagaming, but that's okay, we, we do that at our table. And we were like, we can't fight this thing. And he was just in our camp, he was like, hey, can I have some tea? And we're like, yes, Rev you can have some tea. We were all, like, peeing our pants, scared of this thing, because we, we knew we could not beat it, and he decided to attack us. And then, in the climax of the game, we threw a jar of acid at his head, and it melted. So that was very <laughs> satisfying. <laughs> Another kind of the kind of hostile boss fight, which I just think I can't paint. There's uh, evil very powerful and uh, it's not well, it's what you call this is evil cult or whatever. Well, China we hear from the tenant. But after a walk said, we go, oh, hey lieutenant. Uh. No somebody knocks an opportunity goes, why not kill? Why bother? I'm going to destroy everything that I need to later anyway. Better have people fear me. Mm -hmm. Not the part of you, hey, hey, Send them back when they're more skilled. Yep, yep, yep. Or you give them a, a I mean, we're in a game where leveling isn't so much a thing, but you make it so that it's clear that they're not vulnerable to something that is normal, and, but you give them an opportunity to find out what they are vulnerable to. So that's another option, so it becomes the quest to figure out how to get this guy to be done. Something that I've done in the past, Groundhog Day. <laughs> oh yeah, it's oh, over. Oh. It's like every Tempo video games. game out there. Yeah. You die, save and load. <laughs> it starts up, you know, and it gives them the, it, it, they'll get the little aha moment. Oh, we need to be stronger. Or smart. Yeah, my, my superpower as a GM is get, having villains who talk their way out of being like completely killed in, out of hand. Partially because they usually have some sort of um, uh, dead man switch of a sort. Oh yeah, I'm, I've got this spell that's holding the world together basically, and if you kill me, it will stop working. Um, so now the problem becomes: okay, how do we replicate the thing he does without being the kind of person that he is? Um, and uh, it's amazing how often that works. How to the evil players panel? Yes, please do. <laughs> uh, any other questions from the audience? Yes, in the front. Um, when you're setting up a campaign to start with, do you plan out an end goal? Mm -hmm. Like, or are you treating it more like we're doing this kind of episodic, and like there could be 20 seasons of this? Campaign, and so we won't really like we'll end on a climax, but it won't be that, That's why you want to know what their happy endings. Yeah. So if you know that this character wants a house with kids and blah blah blah, engineering the small or engineering the large to hit that target. Um, for me personally, I prefer to have a vague idea of an ending in mind. Like this is what I want the final session to be. I don't really know how to get there, but I have an idea like, uh, like I ran one campaign where I wanted, um, basically I rejiggered the Tarasks to be basically a sentient hurricane. Um, <laughs> how do they, can, they can't defeat it, how do they convince it to turn around and go back out into the ocean? That was what I wanted the final, camp, the final session to be, but how they got there, I didn't know. Um, magic. Magic. They went into his dreams. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I will pretend like I have all planned out. 
I like so I, I know what the, what the pieces are, I know what the sandbox looks like, but I'm expecting people to kick it over, and then eventually I figure out, okay, the footprints are going in this direction, and at some point I know, okay, the game is getting close to the end. We have maybe a dozen sessions left, which may seem like a lot, but it isn't. Um, to, for me to pull these threads together, and I start trying to figure out what things I've introduced, and trying to start snipping off threads until I get everything to pull together. Um, and just come to a nice c conclusion with it, like, oh my gosh, you planned that all along. I'm like, no, I didn't. But it looks like I planned it all along because that's what I do. That's so chaos zone. Listen to your thing. When your players are speculating about what's yeah. going to happen next, yes. Sometimes they pay attention to what idea. they're saying because they we have, have no better ideas than what you're We you have, have a joke in uh, Rule don't Zero. At our table, table. Rule yeah. Zero is don't give the GM ideas. We flagrantly <laughs> violate at every opportunity. <laughs> Um, but it, but it is, yeah, listen to your players. They'll, they'll so often give you good ideas. Steve, did you have any thoughts on that? Um, I, I, te I tend to, to I tend to do a bit of the sandbox with a, a basically like a, a series season in mind. Uh, for the, for season for season one, we're going to get introduced to and eventually fight and defeat probably in some fashion the big bad for this season. Somewhere near the end of the season, we're going to find out what, or maybe at the very end, we're going to find out what season two's theme is. And that actually brings us to exactly time. Actually, we're one over. So, in our negative one minute that we have, uh, I would like to hear either uh, your one final, like, most important takeaway that you want everyone in this room to leave with, or your hottest GM take. <laughs> Your hottest, or, or just what you think you want the most important takeaway to be, either way. Um, you can start, Steve, you want to start? Sure. Um, improv, com Im improv comedy with, with yes and, and building on what the person before you has said is a wonderful skill because it takes a lot of the work off, off of your plate and it makes it more fun for everybody. So be inclusive. You know, diversity at the table isn't about what the people are, but the ideas that they bring. So let them bring their ideas and accept them for what they are. You're playing elf games. <laughs> you're, you're playing adult, adult playing house. It's supposed to be fun. If, I mean, like, don't take yourself too seriously. Don't take the game too seriously. Like, make sure that it's fun. And, uh, and if it's okay to get to the rules wrong now and again. And sometimes it's okay to break them if you need to. Um, but yes, it's supposed to be fun. And I will say, um, don't DM unless you actually want to DM. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's better to have no game than a game in which the DM is miserable. Thank you very much, everybody.